two, one. Hello. Welcome, everyone. I'm David Greenberg. This is episode 16 of the Machine Learning at Helmholtz Centrum Gestalt Seminar. We have a pretty interesting paper today. We're going to touch on neural networks, their confidence, their overconfidence, image classification. We're going to get a bit of a historical perspective of what's changed in machine learning over the past decade or two. Um, we have um, a great paper. We've titled it Known Unknowns, Another Obscure Reference, which no one ever seems to get, but that's fine. Um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the topics of the paper on one slide, and then we'll get into some of the details. We have uh, a number of people in our Zoom chat, and I hope on our YouTube stream as well. So anytime, please do um, interrupt with a question on the chat, and we will uh, have a couple good points in this paper to naturally um, take a break. and. Um, and take questions. Um, I am trying to open the chat. Um, yes. Great. We already have a couple of people saying hi in chat. Great. OK, so we will get started with the paper. It's a, a fairly recent paper on calibration of modern neural networks. I believe this is 2016. Is that wrong? Um, so what is calibration? What are these networks trying to do, and what are they getting right and wrong? Um, so the task that we're talking about in this particular paper is a very common task, and one we've touched on tangentially a bit before, and that's the task of image classification. We have different labels or categories for our images, and our neural network is going to take these images as inputs and assign a label to them. In this case, it's different image categories like a dog, a cat, a car, an airplane. Uh, we'll talk about the data, we'll talk about the networks. And what the network outputs, say we're dealing with 10 categories, although in this paper it's generally 100 categories of images. If we're dealing with 10 categories, it's going to output 10 numbers. And these numbers are probabilities that sum up to one that the image belongs to each of the categories. And ideally, you'd like your network to always output a probability of one for the correct category. This is not possible given you know, the finite information contained in the data and the finite um, you know, abilities of these, of these techniques. But what we're asking here is not just how often do we get the right answer, but does the uncertainty expressed by the network match its own performance? So for example, if it gets the right answer um, in a particular case, and then it assigns an, a 0.95 probability, say 95% probability to the correct class label for this image. Okay, in all the cases where it output a 95% confidence, you'd expect that you know in 95 out of uh, in 19 out of 20 cases it would get the right answer. But it's possible that it's actually in these cases where it's right on average 19 out of 20 times, it's actually assigning 99.99% confidence, that it's way too overconfident. And even if it's getting the right answer very often, it's overestimating its own performance. And what this paper is finding is that modern neural networks, much more than in the past, say 20 years ago, do tend to overestimate their own performance. And even as they have improved in accuracy, they've improved even more in their own confidence and their estimation of their own accuracy. And this is what we're seeing uh, here in figure two. We'll get into the details. Then they go a little further and they go a little more in depth, which is great. And they ask, what are the aspects, the features of these new neural networks, how deep they are, how wide they are, how we train them, what other aspects they have in their architectures that lead to this overconfidence? And then we'll get a little more into the details of the training, how this relates to overfitting, and some results on a whole bunch of different networks and uh, data sets. So this is the overall plan that we're going to follow for this paper. OK, so what is the problem? What are the data? This is the problem. This is from 2009, the CIFAR um, 100 
data set. So there are a hundred different image categories uh, right here. You can see they're grouped into subcategory, into super categories. And then this is a hundred class uh, image data set. There's earlier versions with only 10 classes, which some of the earlier networks were trained on. These are typical images, a raccoon, a lamp. I'm not quite sure what this is, some kind of weather pattern, camel, um, and so on. So the, the network has to take these images inputs and then use usually using convolutional operations, but it could be lots of different things. It's going to process this image, output a list of 100 probabilities, and we'll ask how often does it assign the highest probability to the correct class label? So will this raccoon be labeled a small mammal in a particular, and I'm not seeing raccoon actually, I'm sure it's in here somewhere. Um, or maybe I've just failed at this image classification task, um, as opposed to labeling it a chair, an apple, a mushroom, an orchid, and so on. Okay. You said something very interesting there because you said, um, you can't even label this image and you expect from your machine to do it. And we have these machines that achieve like really, really high accuracy on these image data sets. So um, do you think that machines are what in, in terms of accuracy are way better than humans already here? Well, it's a good question, but I mean, presumably a human would have applied the label, perhaps using a higher resolution version of this image. I'm a little stumped at what this image is going to be. This is clearly a raccoon. I'm not stupid, right? <laughs> this is a Vosh bear, yeah? But I don't see that on the list. It should be in small mammals. Is it maybe in medium sized size mammal? Oh, that's a problem. I was looking in the wrong supercategory. So it is on the list. Okay. The crisis has been averted. But yeah, in some cases, it's not so <laughs> easy. And I think this is a topic we might cover in some other time in detail. When you have these machine learning tasks, where you have supervised data to train the method and also to evaluate performance, sometimes the supervised data was created by very fallible humans. And then it's nice to know how fallible um, those humans were and how that affected the data set. One thing you can do, of course, is just get a few different people to label the same data set and you can see how much they disagree. And that's kind of going to be an upper bound for the accuracy of the network. Um, Although I guess some people can claim that the networks can be more accurate than any of the humans. How you, how you prove that is a little tricky. Um, in any case, this is the task. We have these images and we're supposed to assign these 100 labels. Um, okay. Now, what is calibration and what this paper is all about? Calibration is the idea that if the network performs perfectly, it assigns the correct posterior probability that is given the data set, given the distribution of different class labels, the distribution of images for each class label, given all that information, given the image we see, we have the, the true probability of each class label. Exactly what this means and the difference between Bayesian and frequentist statistics isn't something we're gonna get into right now, but the idea being that if everything works perfectly, then the, uh, the probability of having the correct class label uh, should be exactly what is returned by the network, right? So that given um, the, uh, the true probability of uh, a correct class given the image P, then the um, the, that should be equal to the confidence assigned by the, uh, the network. Um, and that in fact, the probability, if you look at many cases with the same confidence, or so if the confidence of the, uh, as, as P with a little hat on it, the confidence of the network here is big P with a hat, then is little P, then the probability of having the right answer should be equal to your confidence if you uh, have estimated all the probabilities perfectly. Is that... Um, yeah, okay, so if-, if yeah, There's a simple uh, example in the paper. They say, given 100 predictions, each with confidence of 0 0.8, we expect that 80 should be correctly classified. Right, That's what this says. if the network is calibrated. Yeah, right. If the network is calibrated, exactly. Okay, that was a much, much better explanation than me trying to explain this formula. Okay, um, and then we have a way of measuring the extent to which this is not so, the expected calibration error, right? So we say, that if the confidence is little p, then we should be correct little p fraction of the time. But in fact, it's possible for us to be very confident 
all the time and all wrong all the time. So it may be the probability of correctness on the left here is not equal to our confidence. Um, and we can measure the average absolute difference between the probability of being correct and our confidence. The problem with this, of course, is that we need to take um, an average of all the outcomes for one confidence, but the exact same confidence doesn't repeat because it's a continuous number between zero and one. So what we have to do to actually calculate this in practice is divide the confidence into bins. So we have a little, we have M bins, right? And then in each, so we basically divide the, all the possible confidences between zero and one, between totally unsure and, um, uh, and, uh, and extremely sure. And, in each of these bins, in these histogram bins, we say, how accurate are we as a function of confidence? So for a given level of confidence in this confidence bin, um, maybe that bin might be okay, 25 to 30% confidence if we're using bins of 5%, so 20 bins. So given that we're in this bin, how often are we right? And if we uh, are in the bin of 25 to 30% confidence, we would expect to be right 25 to 30% of the time. Um, that's our accuracy. And then overall, we can also ask, you know, within that bin, where do things fall, you know, because there's going to be a little binning error. So we can ask, what is the confidence within that bin? Okay, so having to define the confidence in each bin and the accuracy in each bin, we can have a version of the expected calibration error that we can actually com compute um, with a finite amount of data, right? So we're saying then um, for each bin, we say the accuracy should be equal to the confidence in each bin. Um, and then we average that over the bins and then we get an overall uh, measure of how over or under confident the network is compared to its own prediction. Okay. And then there's one more thing to mention here as well. Um, in addition to evaluating the expected calibration error, there's also the negative log likelihood. Uh, which is just to say that we should get, um, we should assign as high a probability to the correct uh, bin as possible. So these measure different things. The expected calibration error is only looking, so if you have a list of 10 or 100 output probabilities, the expected calibration error is not looking at all the information in that vector of 10 or 100 elements. It's only looking at how often is the highest value in that vector in the correct place. How often do we assign the correct uh, label with highest probability? It doesn't care how high or low it is, it just has to be higher than the others. Likewise, it doesn't matter what the values of the other 99 or 99 uh, probabilities are. It just matters, do we get the correct answer with highest probability? So it's discarding a lot of information from the neural network's outputs. Negative log likelihood doesn't really do that. It looks at the probability for the correct um, for the correct bin. And therefore, to, to get expected calibration error, it doesn't have to uh, down to zero. It just has to get the right answer, the uh, right frequency of the time, right? That, that the frequency of getting the right answer has to match your confidence in each bin. But to get the negative log likelihood as low as possible, you actually have to have the correct probabilities. Um, so it measures a little bit more. And uh, it's also worth noting that this, because it doesn't involve maxima or thresholding, is differentiable and is actually what we're using to train the network. So we're maximizing the log probabilities of the correct bin, of the correct label, sorry, and we're minimizing the negative log likelihoods. So essentially, um, what we're doing, this is how we train the networks, but this is kind of what we're going to use to evaluate a calibration. So we've gone a little bit into abstraction, we've gone a little bit into um, equations. I hope this is clear. This is a good time to ask a question. Uh, what we're going to move on to next is the different networks. We're going to look at networks from 1998 and 2016. But is this stuff clear? Is it clear what calibration measures, how we're measuring deviation from good calibration, and then what is the overall like log likelihood maximization we're using to train the network. And we're, I'll, I'll quote this little last bit of text. We're saying it's a standard result that the negative log likelihood is minimized in expectation by the network only if the estimated list of probabilities of posterior distribution given of each class label given the data recovers the ground truth conditional distribution of class labels given data. 
So we, if we get all the probabilities correct, only then will we, will we on average minimize the negative log likelihood. Any questions here before we move on? I'd like to understand better the, in the equation for accuracy, what is the significance of the one in the sum? Oh, uh, the one is an indicator function. So it's bold. This is not the best notation. You often see an extra vertical line in the one. So basically this is a function, which is, uh, it's a function of um, uh, y i, the, uh, the true label, and it's one if, well, it's a function of that and the, so y i hat is the, is the uh, Predicted class there. label assigned highest probability by the network. Y i without a hat is the true class label. And this is a function which is one when they're equal and zero otherwise. So basically this counts the number of times we've got the right answer. We divide that by the number of overall exemplars in this bin. So the overall cases where the probability, the confidence fell into this histogram bin. So we're just looking at if we're in this bin, what's the average chance of getting this correct? But this is just a specific notation. Good. No, thanks for the question. Yeah, okay. Um, any other questions about these formulas before we move on? Maybe we'll come back to them after we've gotten a more intuitive feel for what the networks are and what are the main issues we're dealing with in this paper. But feel free to chime in. Uh, Any time. Okay, so what they're claiming, as I mentioned in the abstract um, in the first slide, is they're claiming that over time networks have gotten more accurate, but they've also gotten more overconfident and their calibration has become worse. And they mentioned in the paper, I'm not including this in the presentation, but this is really important. You know, if, if you want to have, say, a self driving car, I think this is the example they give in their introduction, where um, you you maybe sometimes force the driver to, to take a turn or to hit the brakes, but sometimes you can do it for them. But maybe sometimes you play a chime saying, hey, quickly take over, please. It's nice to be very good at driving. What's even more important is to know when you haven't understood the situation correctly and you get the human to take over. And, and in these safety critical applications, it's much more important to ask the humans for help, um, such as they are and such as the help they can give you is, um, than it is to um, just the Zoom chat from Felix Stille. Aren't there some trade-offs here? Like when you are more right more often, doesn't it pay off more in terms of loss minimization if you are more confident? And also, as log likelihood only looks at the correct class, you also somehow minimize the chance to be very wrong if you put all bags in one of 100 baskets. Yes, um, it's true. So the log likelihood only looks at the correct class. Uh, however, it looks at the probability, not just whether we had the highest probability there. And it's true that you know if you knew that you were right, you ought to assign 100% probability to the, um, to the correct class. And then you'll actually have a negative um, log probability of zero, and you'll, you'll be doing as well as is actually possible. Because there's a logarithm in equation six, you know, the best you can do is zero when the true probability is one and you estimate that. The worst you can do is infinitely high loss. So um, basically by punishing very overconfident mistakes in the limit of many training examples, many training iterations, um, you will, and this is the Friedman et al. Uh, paper they're citing, you will recover the overall set of ground truth conditional uh, probabilities um, by training on this loss. Um, and and it's, it does this by basically using the logarithm to excessively penalize overconfident wrong answers. Yeah, there was one thing I quickly wanted to, um, to mention. So if we look at the bottom right of the current slide, there's this uh, distribution pi of y given x. So these are random variables, and it means that not only is the probability of y being the true label correct, um, given, given the input x, but the full distribution. So if you, this expectation that they're talking about is an integral over all possible pairs of images and their labels. Mm -hmm. So in practice, it might not be the case that you should ever put all your bags in the same bin. That is that you have 100% confidence in a single class. 
we've seen that before with the raccoon, where it was not 100% clear that it could have only been a raccoon. I mean, David was quite confident, but he quite soon also admitted the possibility he might be wrong. So we know he wasn't 100% sure in the beginning. So depending on how the situation is, you might actually have distributions over class labels given an image that is not one zero. And if the network still does that during training because it's trying to optimize the loss, the sum over i onto n up with, with, which is a finite data set and is finite with a very deep neural network, you're running into something that we call overfitting which might be actually, as we might discuss later on, one of the main causes that is driving this miscalibration, this overconfidence in this paper. Yeah, thanks, brother. That's a good explanation. I feel like it's going to be a while before I live this raccoon incident down. <laughs> but let's, let's move on. Um, this is a network from 1998. This is a great paper, a lot of really interesting stuff in there. Um, um, a lot of, every one of these authors has gone on to do amazing stuff since. Um, but this is a simple network, right? They're doing a classification of handwritten uh, letters and digits. You have a 32 by 32 input image. You have some convolutional feature maps, something we've seen in a lot of our episodes. So that is you have one input channel, which is just grayscale black and white. But then as you move through the network, you have multiple channels and they're connected to each other by those convolutions. Um, and then you go through convolutions, 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 as we've seen in so many other examples, as you go deeper in the network, the resolution decreases. You see fewer and fewer pixels in each image channel. We're going from 32 by 32 to 28 by 28 with six channels, to 14 by 14 by six channels, to 10 by 10 by 16 channels, by five by five by 16 channels, and so we're getting closer and closer to having a lot of channels and fewer and fewer pixels. And then finally, we, don't, we have only one pixel. We, have only basic, we don't have any more spatial structure, but now we have 120 elements of this spatially unstructured vector. And we have a fully connected layer mapping us down to 84 elements, and then finally 10 elements, which um, basically are uh, then you put through a softmax function and you get the output. So we'll talk about softmax later, but basically you get your probabilities, your 10 probabilities. This was on, um, I think they were classifying uh, 10 digits. Uh, you could do 10 image categories. We're doing 100, but it's the same principle. So there's not that many pixels, there's not that many channels, and there's not that many layers. This is still a lot for 1998. They didn't have graphics cards back then. Um, and they didn't have all our fancy tricks. Um, okay, this is their network from 1998. Now, here is a network, or rather several networks from a paper, a gra another great paper in 2016, 2015 on archive. So we're seeing um, BGG19, a network whose, whose layers and features we've seen used in a few other examples to, to create uh, lots of super GANs but it's a relatively deep network. Here is a network around, um, these are trained on larger images and 100 by 100, uh, 100 uh, for 100 channel. Um, this is actually, this is for 10, 10 category um, in this paper, but they also look at other, um, I believe 100 as well. So this is um, uh, 19 layers and we have in this ResNet uh, uh, paper where the whole topic was how can we train deeper networks and they got very good results doing so. Um, we go to 34 layers, and if you look in the paper, they go as far as 1,200 layers in their network, 19 and a half million parameters. Uh, you can see they, their performance already saturates by about 110 layers, but you know, compared to this, we're in a completely different realm. We're in a completely different realm of hardware, software, the tricks you need to get it to work, the way it's constructed, and it just works so much better at identifying the correct label. Um, and as well as for all their applications, we, we've seen a lot of papers using these residual blocks. Okay, so things have changed a lot in terms of network architecture and how we train them. And performance has really increased in classification. Well, then let's go back to the main thesis of this paper. This is a bit of a complicated set of graphs. So we'll go through it bit by bit. 
So I mentioned we have bins on the confidence axis, right? So the network is outputting a hundred different probabilities. And we're looking on the x-axis is the highest one of those. For a particular image input, what is the highest of those hundred probabilities? That's your confidence. And it can be as high as almost a hundred percent saying the network is totally sure which label it is. Um, or it can be kind of maybe in the more raccoon territory down here um, where it says, ah, I'm pretty sure it's this one, but only maybe 60, 70% sure. Um, and this blue histogram is, uh, this is for the 1998 network, uh, which was originally developed for a 10 class image classification, but here they've used it for a hundred. So they've basically kept it the same, I think, but increased the last few layers size. You see this histogram of how confident we are. That's blue, right? And then if you look at the overall average, it's just about 50%. Uh, their accuracy is just Hello. over 50%, which um, nah. guys, please stay muted if you're not uh, speaking. Um, uh, the, the accuracy is a little bit Us? over 50%, which doesn't sound so good until you remember that there are 100 categories equally balanced. So if, um, if you That's are, should... uh, if you are, um, guessing at random, you only are going to have 1% accuracy. So 50% is not that bad. Um, now let's look at ResNet from 2016, I believe with 110 layers instead of five layers. We can see, first of all, the histogram has completely changed. We are, in many cases, we're over 95% confident. Also, um, we're very rarely you know, below 50% confident. Our accuracy has increased dramatically. All this years of hard work uh, has sort of paid off. We've gone from just above 50% to about 70%. And I think the current numbers in 2020 would be even higher. But you can see for however much conf accuracy has increased, confidence has increased even more. On average, ELINET was underconfident. Its average confidence was less than its average accuracy. On the other hand, ResNet from 2016 is way overconfident. We have this big gap. And how does this arise? Well, one thing we can do to break us down is for each of these histogram bins, actually we're using slightly thicker bins down here, for every bin from, uh, here we have zero to 10% confidence, 10 to 20, we're looking at um, the, um, the accuracy of, um, of the network as a function of how confident it was. And remember, let's jump back, if the, network were perfectly calibrated, the confidence and the accuracy would be equal, these would be equal, and the expected calibration error would be zero. So we should be on a straight line that confidence and accuracy would be equal. We can see that the, um, the, for the LENet for 1998, this is almost true, right? If we look, um, and the accuracy as in blue as a function of our confidence is almost on a straight line. When it gets very confident, it maybe isn't, um, it can be a little, uh, a little um, underconfident, a little overconfident, but we have this not too big of a gap between our expected performance as, as described by our confidence and our actual performance as described by our accuracy for that confidence bin. So one more time, for each of these 10 histogram bins, we're saying, given that we're, say, here, 60 to 70% confident, how accurate are we? And we're actually about 60%, 65%, not bad. Now let's look at ResNet from 2016. For one, we're, we have almost no data in the 0 to 10%. It's never that unsure of itself. We have a lot of data in the 90 to 100%. But we see in the 90 to 100%, our accuracy is only about 80%. In the... 80 to 90 percent bin, our accuracy is only about 50 percent. We're only getting the right answer some 50 percent of the time. So overall, we're way more accurate. The overall error is we're 30 percent, right? Where we're right some 70 percent of the time, while only 55 percent of the time, um, you know, 18 years earlier. But the gap between how right we think we are versus how right we actually are has grown immensely. So these networks, despite their improvement in accuracy, are no longer well calibrated and they are just way too full of themselves. This is the main finding, and I think a quite surprising, interesting finding, 
that was uncovered by this paper. And now they're going to go in and kind of um, ask why, what changed about networks, many things, but what changed about networks in the 18 years intervening, now 22 years, which caused this overconfidence. This is another good time to take questions. These are important graphs to understand. If you don't get what's going on here, it'll be very difficult to follow the rest of the paper. So uh, I guess we'll move on, but if anyone wants to chime in, Marcel, you're watching the uh, YouTube comments, huh? I'm watching the YouTube channel comments. I'm not having the Zoom. No, I've got the Zoom chat. I've got the Zoom chat. Okay. Um, someday we'll get a YouTube comment. Okay. Um, so let's move on. What about the changes in neural networks from Elinet with its five layers to ResNet with its 110 layers or more cause these changes both in accuracy that the error, the overall rate of error goes down, but the calibration error goes up, the overconfidence is increased. So the first thing to look at is just how deep are the networks? So they're looking at ResNets these networks which can be made very deep, and they're looking at very short, very, very shallow to very deep networks. And as we see, as the network gets deeper, as you'd expect, the number of parameters increases, the ability to fit data increases, and as I described in that excellent 2016 paper, the error decreases as you add more layers. On the other hand, the calibration error, the extent to which the confidence and the performance do not match, increases. So this is one factor which is um, causing the increase in overconfidence. The other thing, of course, is how wide these layers are. So if we go back, um, we're seeing you know, um, things like 512 channels, 256 channels in VGG, 128 channels in the ResNet, and then let's go back to Elinet and we're seeing, wow, like a whole 16 channels, you know, it's not that, not that wide either. And we see a similar trend, right? Using more channels allows the network to represent more features of the data at each layer and allowing it to do that makes it more accurate. It, more often, and here error is simply the rate that the, the probability that it assigns its own highest probability to the wrong class. Um, but as this gets lower with wider uh, network, that is to say with more channels um, in each layer, the calibration error also increases. Uh, a third feature they look at is called batch normalization, which are these layers you can stick in between your other layers, and they basically look at multiple data points passing through, and they kind of standardize them by giving them a mean of zero and a, a stem deviation of, of roughly one. Um, so it allows you to kind of numerically stabilize your training procedures by keeping your data in the same numerical range. It's kind of weird in that the result for one data point now depends on others, which normally shouldn't be the case, but it has proven a very effective way of preventing these networks from overfitting too much. And uh, indeed, we see an improvement in accuracy, not dramatic, but there's an improvement. Um, but we also see an increase in overconfidence in the expected calibration error. And then finally, there's a weight decay, which used to be a very commonly used um, uh, technique for preventing overfitting. The idea being that as you see new data points and update your neural network weights, you also have them just kind of relaxing back to zero and forgetting things so that you have a balance between what you've recently learned and the decay and forgetting process. This prevents um, the, it can prevent things from getting too tight, too overconfident, too overfit. Um, and it's not in common use anymore because now we have other ways of dealing with this. For example, batch normalization, the third figure. Um, and we see that, you know, it's, a, it's a, basically a hyperparameter. It's a procedure, of, uh, it's a parameter of the training procedure that can be adjusted. And for certain values, it does improve things. Uh, if you make it too small or too large, you get worse accuracy. But in general, when you make it larger, you reduce calibration error um, 
almost down to zero, uh, but this is not in common use anymore. So these are four changes in the nature of neural networks and how we train them that have taken place between 1998 and 2016, all of which contribute to um, the uh, overconfidence. And I just want to point out what a great, in my opinion, great approach this is. Like they identified a problem. They, they do what's called an ablation study where they sort of they added and removed different features of the networks and their training procedures, and they identified what the cause is. This is a level of detail, even though this is an extremely simple bit of analysis um, compared to most machine learning papers um, where they were really thorough and they came up with a very nice, clear result. I think this is an excellent paper and we should all try to write machine learning papers like this. Um, so to explain a little bit more what's happening, so recall that we have these two ways of evaluating accuracy. Um, and let me actually go back to the definitions for a moment. Um, we have the accuracy in terms of how often do you assign the highest probability to the correct class? And then we have accuracy measured as the negative log likelihood, which is to say, we want to make the log probability for the correct class as high as possible. On the left side, it doesn't matter how exactly high it is or low it is, it just has to be higher than all the other classes. Um, so in the case of 100 classes, it could be as low as 1.1%, you know, and it could still be higher than all the other classes and you have perfect accuracy. But for the negative log likelihood, you wanna really assign as high as possible a probability. So to really, to, ma to minimize this loss, which is actually what the networks are trained on, you have to really push that probability toward one. Uh, and, be, uh, and only when you're totally confident in the right answer all the time, have you minimized that loss completely. Okay, so what's happening here? Let's just dissect this graph. We have two things on the y-axis. We have the test error, which is the fraction of the time where uh, we assign the, the highest probability to the wrong class. This is like our accuracy-based evaluation. And then in blue, we have a scaled version to keep them on the same graph of the negative log likelihood, which only goes to zero when we assign the correct class 100% um, certainty. Okay, and what is on the x-axis is the epoch. So as we train, we have all our data, right? We have our images and we have their correct class labels. So as we train, we're showing these to the network. We're saying, this is a correct answer. What do you have? Okay, adjust your network weights to increase the probability of the correct class label. And we keep going through that. And we have a lot of data. I believe we have, um, I think I showed this somewhere. We have, this dreaded raccoon again. We have 100 classes containing 600 images each. So 60,000 images. After we've shown every one of these to the network and updated its weights each time, that's one epoch. We've now completed one epoch of training. And this shows the performance over 500 epochs. So basically, um, 30 million image presentations, if, if I'm not uh, wrong. I, I got my bachelor's degree in math, pure math, so I, I really can't do arithmetic. Maybe someone can correct that. But in any case, we have, um, as one would hope, as one would expect, the performance increases during training, and it's getting better and better and better and better. Both the test error that is, is decreasing to say more and more often we're assigning the highest probability to the correct class. And we're assigning higher probabilities to the correct class and that the negative log likelihood is also decreasing. But then somewhere around Epic 250, where we've seen every image 250 times already, something really interesting happens. One, the network suddenly has a eureka moment and its, improvement, it's a performance improves a whole bunch. So the, um, it goes from about wrong about 37% of the time to suddenly down to about 27% of the time. And then at the same time, the negative log likelihood, uh, which has been scaled, it also drops by a reasonable factor. Um, but then what happens? We keep training. And then the negative likelihood, log likelihood increases. Now I should say this is a test negative log likelihood, right? So we're training on one set of data and then we're testing on another set of data. Otherwise our results really aren't, aren't valid. 
Um, but so what we're seeing is a failure of generalization that as we're training and getting lower and lower error on our training data, our test on the log life data is actually increasing because it's just basically starting to memorize the training data and, and, and over-specialize this network ways to only perform well on that data, which most networks will do if you give them enough epochs to train on. And the negative log likelihood is uh, increasing. It's no longer assigning the highest probability um, a, a very high probability this is the correct class. But at the same time as this error, the objective function which is training on is increasing on the test set, the, the accuracy measured by the probability of assigning your highest score to the correct class, your highest probability of the correct class is actually decreasing in this seemingly paradoxical way. That while we're overfitting a negative log likelihood, the accuracy measured by the chance of assigning the highest probability to the correct class is actually getting better. Um, this is sort of perplexing. Um, and this, I think, is hypothesized by the authors to explain why we are getting really good accuracy with these architectures, but we're overconfident because the labels we're outputting are correct more and more, but our probabilities are wrong as evidenced by the blue curve, right? The blue curve goes to zero when all the probabilities are correct and we have the correct confidence, but the red curve doesn't care how confident we are. It just cares, do we assign the highest probability to the correct class? Um, this phenomenon renders a concrete explanation, I'm quoting from the paper, of miscalibration. The network learns better classification accuracy at the expense of well-modeled probabilities. Okay, so, so far we've talked about the problem. They've shown which features of the architecture are important for it. They've um, gone, here we can see a partial, somewhat hazy, but sort of convincing explanation of how it might be happening. And now finally, we're going to talk about uh, how they go about correcting this misclassification error, um, uh, or this, this miscalibration, that is, this overconfidence without compromising the accuracy of their results. Um, but this is a good time to take questions and comments before we do the topic change. Yeah, so one thing I really quickly wanted to point out how curious, in particular, this figure on the left is. So, the blue line going up, as Steven pointed out, means that we have pretty bad overfitting going on um, in, the, in the later stages of the training phase. So the reason why the error drops so dramatically after epoch 250 is that hidden in the caption on the image is that they just reduce the learning rate by a factor of 10. So what that means is that for the first 250 epochs, they train the network very greedily with a very high learning rate. So the gradients were pretty large, the states was jumping around all over the place, and then they switched to a fine tuning phase after 250 epochs. And this is then where really the, the weights really get fine tuned, and apparently this seems to be where the network can really start overfitting to the data. So it starts memorizing parts of the training data, that will not be present in the test data. So this generalization makes sense. What is really, really curious, as David pointed out, is that the red curve stays flat. And there's one thing to remember is that the, the blue curve is the negative log likelihood. So that is really the log of the actual probabilities that a network is actually trained on. Now the test error is related to the correct label. So it's related to the ArcMax operator applied to the categorical distributions that the network puts out. So it's a non-linear function applied to what the network is actually trained on. And this is a very cur curious finding that I really didn't expect because I also never really worked with classification, especially with classification with many labels, is that correct label seems to behave completely different from getting the correct probability distribution, which is the actual target of the neural network. So if we go back one slide um, to these other figures, 
if we just look at the red curves, so red curve performance, which is related to the full distribution, the full categorical distribution over all classes, becomes worse when we add more layers, when we add more filters per layer, when we add normalization, batch normalization, all of these things add parameters to the network, even though the training data set size is fixed. So all of these things classically, you would say, increase our tendency to overfit. If you just looked at the red curves, especially the weight decay. So weight decay is a normalization that you introduce if you know you have too many net free parameters in your network. So what you do is you restrict the mean squared uh, amplitude of the sum of all of the weights in the network, pushing them to zero so that you restrict them. So you kind of take flexibility out of the neural network. Now, if you increase the weight decay, it has a, it has a global parameter that says how much you punish large network weights. Then usually what happens is the generalization error goes down because you may have a lot of the parameters in your neural network. In this particular case, I thought, I think we saw it's 1.7 million. Um, but they are no longer, for, for strong weight decay, they're no longer as free to change because you, you punish their norm. So effectively, you have fewer. So increasing the depth, increasing the filters per layer, adding batch normalization all makes the network more flexible and more prone to overfitting. Weight decay does the exact opposite, which is why high weight decay is the only one where the red curve goes down. So if people would have just looked at that, they would have noticed decades ago that as they make their neural networks more and more powerful, they're just starting to overfit really hard. But there's this interesting thing in the behavior of this ArcMax operator of the true label that completely masks that. Like it, it became better and better as the networks started overfitting harder and harder. And I think that's a really curious observation, almost machine learning historically, how I think in, in regression, right? I mean, all of this is about classification. In regression, people would have noticed way earlier that this is a problem than in classification, where everybody seemed to just be focused single-mindedly until, until this paper and similar papers that came around single-mindedly just on the accuracy, like in this case, error being one minus accuracy. Hmm. At least that's my take. Maybe this is wrong. quite interesting. I mean, right, in, in regression, people usually use the sum of square errors. You would? Yeah, I mean, if you do sum of square, then, but then you're assuming a Gaussian likelihood, right? Mm -hmm. So you're only looking at the likelihood, which is related much closer with the ECE. I mean, you can beautifully see it in, in, the, in the graph. You see it is, is, is um, sort of independent of accuracy. This is miscalibration. Well, the ECE is the probability at ground truth label minus the probability that it's supposed to produce. Yeah. So that is pretty much the mean squared error, no, no. The, the absolute error on the model probabilities pi of y given x that it's supposed to produce. It's, pretty, right. it's, it's, a, it's very related to the negative log likelihood. But you can have very bad accuracy and very bad negative log likelihood and still have a, a very low ECE. You can be perfectly calibrated and, and almost always get the wrong answer, yes. as long as you know it. And likewise, you can be very accurate and have a terrible ECE, which I guess is what these deep, wide, fancy networks do. Yes. So the, the actual thing to look at I would think is actually the negative log likelihood that you've seen in the in the other graph. That like this is a problem. I agree. There's something very profound going on here. I can't say quite what it is and what it arises from. I feel it's almost a property of the data itself, and the you know the extent to which you can generalize from a certain number of pictures of cars or raccoons or something um, to one you haven't seen. And apparently, you can do it in such a way that if you really overfit with these networks, you, your, your, your negative log likelihood goes up well, you still guess the right category most often. There may be some kind of weird selective bias in that you know people tried a lot. Even though they trained these networks on negative log likelihood, they often reported their numbers in their tables that got them into their prestigious conferences and got them um, you know, the opportunity to do more research on this subject, 
It was all based on accuracy. So maybe there, the field as a whole did some sort of optimization procedure on network architectures that produced, or training procedures that produced this effect. I'm currently looking, does anybody find in the paper the negative log likelihoods that they're reporting? They're only reporting accuracy and miscalibration, right? I don't know. Toby, you looked at the uh, supplementary material, huh? Uh, not so close to answer that question. All right. Well, we can see, we can follow up with that. There's another question from the chat. Could one formulate a loss function that is better aimed at exactly the correct confidence or is a problem somewhere else? Yeah, that is a damn interesting question. So one thing you could do is before you get the confidence, you could just say, I want to maximize my accuracy in terms of I want to assign the correct label, the highest probability than the others. doesn't matter what else. Uh, then you could go beyond that and just say, I want to do this with the correct, I want the confidence to be correct. Both of these have the issue that as Marcel pointed out, there's an arg max. That is to say, you have a vector of probabilities and you're choosing the one that's highest. This is not a differentiable operation. That is, you cannot compute the derivative of the outputs of that operation with respect to the inputs. And that means it's a little bit more difficult to train a neural network to do it. It's much easier to train it on negative log likelihood because everything is a differentiable function of the network weights. So it's not impossible to do that, but it is tricky. I'm just pointing out that the negative likelihood being the negative probability of a certain label given the input, you're essentially training the confidences, the, the p-values, and then you're outmaxing those in order to get the labels. So if you train your neural network with maximum likelihood as they're doing, and you make sure that it doesn't overfit, then you should actually have calibrated, somewhat calibrated, um, uh, sorry, I'm not going to move confidences from the get-go. You should, and yet, as you can see, actually, with the red curves uh, from the other figures from, from before, that if you do stuff that reduces overfitting, the EC goes down. Like, if you reduce the depth of your network, if you reduce... Well, the EC is phase, over... Oh, I see. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, ECE as a, a measure of miscalibration yeah. that they're using throughout the paper. What you would do if you think that you're overfitting, you would either start regularizing, so increasing the weight pancake, so going to the right and the rightmost panel, or you would take out parameters of your network, which is to go left in the two left panels. And all of these measures, which are classical measures against overfitting, seem to help with miscalibration. But they also decrease accuracy. Yes. So, all right, so this is a dilemma. There's a trade-off. And then this brings us to the next part of the paper where they say, can we increase, um, can we improve the calibration of our networks? Can we give them the correct confidence without compromising accuracy? And in fact, it turns out they can. So I mentioned before that there's a soft max. Let's go back to the very beginning where I showed, or almost, I showed there's 10 outputs, right, from Elinet for these 10 classes at the time. And what are these? These are not probabilities. They're, they're numbers which don't add up to one. In fact, some of them can even be negative. This is generally what you know neural network output units do if they're not specifically constrained to add up to one. So we have these 10 numbers. How do we get 10 probabilities? We use a softmax on them. And what is a softmax? We take each of these 10 numbers output by the network, each z. We put it through an exponential function, so now it's positive, And then we divide by the sum, so they all add up to 1. That's a softmax operation. OK, so now we have our probabilities. To correct this, the authors of the present paper propose a technique they call temperature scaling, where they take all the out these numbers z that come out of the network, this can be positive or negative, and they divide them by a, num a temperature parameter t before putting them into the softmax. So let's just think intuitively what happens, right? Exponential function of zero is one, right? So if I use a very, very big t, all of these 
exponents will approach one, and then we have one over a sum of ones, and all the probabilities will be will approach the same value. So if I have 100 classes, as t goes to infinity, all of the probabilities will go to 1%. When I set t equals one, I haven't done anything, and I'm just using the original probabilities that were output by my number, my network, right? So the idea is, starting with t equals one, I have the probabilities output by my network that were learned during the training. As I increase the temperature, I'm pushing the distribution flatter and flatter so that um, the uh, probabilities tend to be more even and it assigns equal likelihood to each class. Um, so the neat thing about, so I'll just read out this quote from the paper. T is called the temperature and it softens the softmax, i.e. raises the output entropy, that is to say, makes all the probabilities more equal with T greater than one. As T approaches infinity, the probability approaches one over K, K being the number of classes, which represents maximum uncertainty. With T equals wrong, we recover the original probability. As T approaches zero, the probability collapses to a point mass uh, that it assigns 100% co confidence to one class. It's optimized with respect to NLL on the validation set. So before we talked about training data and testing data, now we're leaving out another bit of data from the training and we're using this to estimate T before evaluating the, the whole procedure T and the network weights on the test data. But this is the key point and this is why this is such a nice clever idea. If not particularly complicated, it's really effective because the parameter T does not change the maximum of the softmax function, the class prediction, that is the argmax, that is the, for the class which gets the highest output probability remains unchanged. In other words, temperature scaling does not affect the model's accuracy. And why is that? Well, let's say we have all these Zs, right? Whichever Z is highest is gonna have the highest exponent, which means that's gonna be the highest class label. If we divide them all by two or three or a thousand, what was highest before will still be highest. So this temperature scaling does not change the class label with the highest probability, even as it makes the distribution more flat and decreases the confidence. So this reduces confidence and it doesn't change the accuracy. And um, we're going to estimate it based on data, just like the neural network weights. So here are the results. What they use here, this is, and good, they, they, this is a temperature scaling which they propose. They also review, we're not gonna cover them. Now several other methods in the paper from the literature, which are about equally effective, though probably a little more complicated to use. Um, so we have uncalibrated, this is 110 layer ResNet with uh, 100 class labels. And we can see this overconfidence that we observed. Um, expected calibration error, we're off by you know 12.67. Um, I don't know if that's, I don't know what the units here, I guess this is a sum over bins. But um, then, the, we do the temperature scaling, right? So we basically choose the T based on our val uh, validation data set to maximize negative log likelihood on the validation set. And then finally, uh, this is data which the network has never seen during training of the weights. And then we go to test data and we evaluate the uh, accuracy and the, the calibration. We can see we get this really nice straight line. Um, we can see it's, um, you know, uh, a little overconfident when, when it's very underconfident. This is a bit strange, but okay. So this is temperature scaling. These are two other methods which perform almost as well that exist in the literature, but the method they propose seems to work really well for this data, possibly because it only has to estimate one parameter, this temperature, uh, only one number for the whole, the whole task. Um, and so then, um, this is a bit of, a, of an abstract, but we're seeing basically the, um, given how far you've trained, you can see the optimal temperature and we can see it stays around one or a little higher. There's not much to be done until we have this change in learning rate. We have um, uh, a sudden increase in confidence and then the optimal temperature starts increasing in order to do this correction. Uh, one thing they point out, uh, I won't get into this too much, but that the, um, uh, there's the entropy of the distribution on class labels output by the network. There's negative log likelihood. And after doing the temperature correction, the entropy and the negative log likelihood become equal. Um, and then they kind of stay around uh, one. 
by definition, because that's what the temperature is supposed to do. Um, and then they basically go and they test this on a whole bunch of different uh, network architectures, different data sets, um, different tasks. I think they have some language tasks, some time series, a lot of image stuff. Um, and you can see the overall expected calibration error as percentages, the, those were the units. So how, what's the gap in percentage between how confident we are and how often we're right on average over the different confidence bins. So basically the average difference between the accuracy curve in blue and then the straight line. And we can see that the temperature scaling for most of these problems does really well or almost as well as everything else. So it's a very nice, very simple approach. Um, and they basically try all these different approaches, but you can see the, the calibration, the error between how confident we are and how often we're right, it can be in some cases as high as 16%. And then the temperature scaling is dropping this to just over 1%. If we go back to the 1998 network, where is LENET 5, we see it doesn't make much difference. We're already down at 4%. Uh, calibration error, we drop it to uh, 3%, we drop it to 1%. So it helps a little, but it's not as much of a problem in these uh, simple networks from the distant, distant past. So this is the overall, um, the overall results. You can see more in the paper. I'm going to end with uh, just reading the conclusion. It's very short. Modern neural networks exhibit a strange phenomenon probabilistic error and miscalibration worsen even as classification error is reduced. We have demonstrated that recent advances in neural network architecture and training, model capacity, that's the width and depth, normalization, that's the batch norm layers, and regularization, that's the um, weight decay, have strong effects on network calibration. It remains future work to understand why these trends affect calibration while improving accuracy. Nevertheless, Simple techniques can effectively remedy the miscalibration phenomenon in neural networks. Temperature scaling is the simplest, fastest, and most straightforward of the methods, and surprisingly is often the most effective. Um, and I know we're starting to think about some classification problems in our research group, and so maybe we'll get a chance to try this out, and maybe we'll show you five minutes of, uh, of graphs on this in the future. Um, so that's all I've got. This is a great time to open up for questions. What do people think? What is going on? with these really weird effects. Yeah, I was wondering before, and uh, I've talked a little bit with Marcel already about this. Um, I was wondering if one could train this parameter T together with the network. But yeah. Yeah, we came to the conclusion that it's not possible because you would use the same data set you're already overfitting on for training your parameter T. Yeah. Yeah. And you want to have the separated validation yeah. data set. I mean, you could train it on the validation data while you train the weights on the training data, which seems to be what they're doing in the supplementary figure. No, I don't think so. Um, because. Well, not, they're doing it. You can see they're getting results for each FX. So they're running. They're right. Yeah. They are not using it as a feedback, um, no. probably, because no. um, what Marcel earlier pointed out um, was that even if you increase. Um, over time, your T would grow and it would grow infinitely because yeah. the neural networks would always try to, um, to comprehend for this, right? I mean, in a certain sense, you already have this T. And it's in the following sense where you have your output, which are these 10 numbers, right? T divides all those numbers by a factor, right? But those numbers are generated by taking the activations of the second to last layer, multiplying them by weights and adding bias terms. So if you double the weights, and double the bias terms, then you've kind of divided T by two, essentially. So you kind of have that scaling built in already. Right. Yeah, just one thing to point out, because we um, also talked a bit about that before. So this temperature scaling that we've encountered here, um, you sometimes see that also in other contexts. So we've seen a bunch of papers where people were um, training GANs in order to um, get pretty pictures, essentially, um, from some distribution that is um, somewhat fit to some data. 
something that they sometimes find when they train GANs and normalizing flows and other stuff, for instance, face images, is that when they afterwards sample from that, they get some very nice faces, but also some that look a bit like an accident. <laughs> Um, because these um, because these distributions that they that they fit with these with these neural networks they are too broad. So here we see an application where one uses this temperature scaling to uh, increase the variances after after training um, by dividing by taking a temperature that is larger than one. What is sometimes done with these generative networks that you want to sample, I mean, it's a basis, but can also be pictures of records and other stuff. And you see that the, the variance of these is too big. What they sometimes do is that they artificially decrease the temperature. What that then does is it focuses these distributions that you've learned onto their peaks and quenches the variance of the, of the pictures that are too far away from the learned peaks. And I think typical values for temperatures in that case are like 0.7. So, and here I think we have, uh, and these are reduced variants. And I think here they learn temperature values of around between 1.5 and 2 in order to um, increase variance. So, these, these kind of techniques of increasing and decreasing temperature, which has its roots in thermodynamics, I think. Oh no, wait. Yeah, it's the Boltzmann equation. Um, comes up as a as a handy trick in a in a bunch of situations. You think of these these as energies. Yeah. Yeah. Another question from the chat from Felix. Maybe this problem also gets better with more data. The ECE seems to drop somewhat on the larger data sets. That is an interesting point. Some of the recent results with self-training also seems to point to more robust classifiers on something like ImageNet A. I am not familiar with that. Felix, do you want to tell us about that? If you feel like. You can tell us about ImageNet A and self-training because it's news to me. Or if anyone else can explain this. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, I hear you fine. Um, yeah, so I'm not an expert on this, but uh, there was this paper, I think, uh, a year ago, which uh, had, like, at that point, state-of-the-art ImageNet accuracy. And what they did was they trained on ImageNet themselves, and then they, they used their classifier to label uh, I think a much larger corpus of unlabeled images and uh, then use those self-labeled images to train again, uh, to train themselves. They use the best ones to train themselves. They use heavy uh, augmentation as well. And uh, what they found is that not only did they achieve state-of-the-art uh, accuracy on ImageNet, but it also was much more robust. So this ImageNet A data set is like a pretty strong robustness test for classifiers. So it has like almost adversarial image examples that where classifiers tend to fail. That's very interesting. It's quite counterintuitive that it's, it seems like very much pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, but I guess it works. Maybe this is a future topic. We could have a look at this. Um, I don't know if they, but did they evaluate, they probably didn't evaluate classification, did they? The, the, the calibration of these, um, ImageNet A networks, did they? No, and uh, not that I'm aware of, but they report uh, the accuracy on this uh, uh, on this ImageNet A uh, data set, which like normally the other classifiers, uh, they, they fail horribly on it. Like the... Mm. Yeah, that's quite interesting. All right, but we should follow up on this. Thanks. Sure. Do we have any other questions or comments? Uh, I have a little question. I don't know. I didn't catch this reading the paper. Did they publish code for their temperature scaling? I mean, it's just a few lines, but. I think they do discuss how many lines it would be. And uh, in this case, they actually say that they were just using torch.nn.mal constant to do all of the work. But the, the optimization for the temperature scaling then, I mean, yes, you can. 
So during training, you just define the value of that parameter to be constant. So you don't require yeah. gradient, you fix it. And then in the second stage, you fix all the network weights, but you, you multiply. And right. during training, you set the temperature to one. Yeah, and you just optimize it using standard gradient-based optimization for a single parameter. And in this case, you could use a million other things as well because it's one number. Yes. Um, but they build it, the scaling, they already build it in from the very beginning. They just don't use it during training. And then during this post-processing, they just optimize that one. It's like switching between training the network and training. Yeah. Um, All right, let's try it sometime. Okay. Thanks to everyone who participated. Um, this was a great paper, I thought, a great session, good discussion. Um, we have a paper for um, uh, two weeks from now. We'll have um, Anikesh Pal presenting a, uh, a paper on radiation parameterizations with machine learning. Um, we'll still want a paper for early November and announcements and five-minute presentations of your own work are always welcome. Uh, thanks again, everyone.